Welcome to Linked Up, Breaking Boundaries in Education, a podcast that focuses on what is happening in education today, connecting everyone to the movers and shakers that are breaking boundaries in the education arena. Welcome to Linked Up, Breaking Boundaries in Education, the podcast that brings practitioners and leaders and researchers and big thinkers right to your device. Now, today we are talking all about professional learning. Jerry, we have a great guest today. We do, but before we talk about our guest, Jamie, were you one that liked professional learning or not? It seems like there's two camps. I did. I really did. I took it all in as much as I could. I did. I was. I figured so. Yeah. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. So I was one of those professional learning nerds too. I always loved it, but there are a lot of teachers that don't. And I would every time we would go to a professional learning, someone would tell this joke that when I die, I hope it's at a faculty meeting or a professional development training because the transition from life to death will be so subtle. They would say that every time. And so I know that there are a lot of teachers that don't like professional development. They call in sick, make appointments. So today we're going to talk to someone that is really changing professional development. And our guest is Rich Shiz. And he started his career as a fifth grade teacher. And then he went on to supervise Uh, curriculum and instruction, and he's currently the proud principal of Yardville Elementary School in New Jersey, and he's the co-founder of Four O'Clock Faculty. He's also written a book called Four O'Clock Faculty, A Rogue Guide to Revolutionizing Professional Development, and The Secret Sauce is the new one essential uh, ingredients for exceptional teaching. So Rich, we are so happy to have you here today. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be here to talk professional development. Oh, we are glad to hear about it. And I'm glad someone out there is revolutionizing it because it really needed a makeover. Yeah, we're, we're trying it. It's funny uh, to hear you talk about that. Um, That meme about, you know, the subtle shift from life to death. um, I've shared that when I start a lot of my sessions. So um, it's it's true in a lot of cases. So were you one of those people that liked professional development when you were a teacher? Yeah, absolutely. Like to to hear you say you're a professional development nerd. um, That's Mm -hmm. me. Right. Any session I could find anywhere I could find it. um, I would go to learn something new. So, yeah. So then what made you become interested in revolutionizing professional development? So for me, it was really two experiences. Um, I started um, as a teacher um, in a brand new building, um, which had just opened up uh, and there were 15 new teachers in that building. And at the time I thought, you know, I'm, I'm a teacher, I'm coming in. It's the principal's job to, to help me get professional development. Um, and in the first year we did uh, a new program that was being uh, implemented for writing. And uh, I was a math teacher. So it was something that I wasn't using in the classroom. Uh, but every month I was made to go sit and, and be uh, at the meetings. And um, it took me until the end of the year to finally work up the courage to say to my principal, hey, do you mind if I don't go to the last meeting? Can I, can I sit with my um, you know, fifth grade partners and work on our math curriculum? And she gave us that time. And at the time, I kind of realized maybe, maybe I should have started much earlier, right, in asking for and, and advocating for what I needed as a learner. So, so that experience and then uh, becoming an administrator, um, I also found that when, you know, professional development was implemented, um, a lot of times teachers wouldn't attend. Uh, so one of the things that always, you know, kind of bothered me. Uh, We had a professional development weekend and the district I was in, um, we had a professional development on the Friday and then a long weekend. And um, one of the teachers wasn't there. So I couldn't figure out why they weren't there. I came back on the following uh, Tuesday, I think, and checked the attendance and like 30% of our teachers took the day off on a PD day. And that was, that was the spark for me. It's like, why are teachers taking the day off when this is something that should be amazing? And um, that was the driving force. And from that moment on, it was, you know, full speed ahead with professional development and making it something that teachers love. Absolutely. And I don't think that that 30% is uncommon. 
most districts I've been in, it, it is about that rate. But I love that you set out to maybe make it relevant to everyone that's in professional development. I know a lot of times people just feel like it's not relevant to what they're doing. Like you said, the math teacher learning the new reading curriculum. Yeah, exactly. Now, uh, you're, I mean, I know as a, I do professional development and I've been, I always ask, so did the teacher sign up for this topic or are you imposing this on them? Because <laughs> Otherwise, if I didn't ask, I'd be able to figure it out right away because those for whom it was imposed are the arm folders, I call them. They're sitting there. <laughs> and I, I don't blame them. I wouldn't want to be there either if it wasn't something that they needed. Maybe they already know. Uh, maybe it's something that doesn't, as you mentioned, doesn't relate to what they actually teach. Uh, so there are many factors there. And I think you hit the nail on the head that professional learning needs to be personalized for what they, what they actually need. So in you know, going rogue, what does that look like? What does personalized training from your perspective and um, from what you've suggested and ideas that you've come up with, what does that look like? Yeah, it's, it's a lot of, um, like you said, meaningful and relevant to individuals. So it's a lot of choice-based, um, a lot of voluntary. Um, so, you know, one of, one of the key words that I always use in, in front of any session that I'm doing is voluntary. Um, I, I want people who want to be there, right? Yeah. So if I'm presenting, um, I know that the people who show up are interested. And then it's a lot of building from the ground up. So, you know, when I talk about ROGUE in the book, um, ROGUE uh, stands for, it's an acronym that stands for a relevant organized group of underground educators. Uh, so it is the people who are, you know, showing up on Saturdays at events, the people who are, you know, now connecting on Clubhouse or, you know, connecting on social media, trying to um, find their own professional learning. And, you know, from, a, from an early stage as an educator, what I figured out was it wasn't the principal's responsibility to, to help me get professional development. It was my own, right? And um, it is about helping people find those opportunities that will help them. Um, you know, one of the examples I always use is uh, I was always responsible for the professional development of the school nurse. You know, I am not a nursing expert and um, we would always make the nurse come to our staff meetings and we were talking about, you know, literacy initiatives or math initiatives and scores and testing and, you know, why is the, why is the nurse sitting there? And sometimes it's asking those people what is it that you need? What can I help provide for you? Um, and as a professional development planner, it's incredibly difficult to plan PD uh, because it's much easier to sit everybody in one room and say, okay, here's what you're getting than it is to say, I have you know, 150 people who have 145 different needs and how do I meet all those needs? So it's a lot of choice. It's a lot of um, you know, different sessions, different um, opportunities, different learning styles. Some people learn better with hands-on. Some people learn better, you know, listening to somebody, um, listening to a podcast, right? That's an opportunity for professional development that you can throw on while you're driving in on your morning commute. Uh, so it's a lot of different options for educators uh, to, to make it really relevant for them. Yeah. You know, when we, when we stick with the one size fits all model, you're going to end up having those teachers who are taking off that day because it just ends up being a, a vicious cycle that way. So you have to you know, break loose and allow for that customization, allow for teachers to determine what it is that they need. It can be in collaboration with other um, faculty members. It could be in collaboration with their supervisors or their principals. Um, but allowing them to be part of the process to determine how they're going to spend their time to uh, build their strengths. It, it makes all the difference in the world. It, we do it in the classroom for students. So why not do it for teachers too? It right. really makes a difference. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And Rich, when you talked about ROGUE, mm -hmm. I love that acronym, by the way, you know, um, I, I thought immediately of ed camps because that seems yeah. like an, a little underground uh, current of teachers that wanted more education. And I know in your book, you talk about ed camps and professional development. Could you, first of all, tell our listeners what is an ed camp because some may not know. And then um, a little bit about the ed camp style and how you used it. 
Sure. So, um, yeah, an ed camp for people who don't know um, is an unconference. Um, so the idea behind it being that you are coming together without any plans for what is going to be discussed. So in most cases at a true ed camp, everybody would show up on the morning of there'd be a, a blank empty board uh, in order to put up all the different topics and people would come up with topics on the spot. So, um, you know, it's, it could be overwhelming if you've ever gone to an ed camp for the first time. Um, you know, going to ed camp was what changed my mindset about professional development and what it could be. Um, and that's kind of where we went in my district, uh, my previous district. So we, we jumped right in with it and gave teachers the opportunity to um, see what an ed camp looked like, um, you know, show up to different sessions that were some, some of their own colleagues were presenting. Um, and, it, and it really kind of changed the dynamic around the professional development culture in the district. So um, it, as I said, it's overwhelming to show up and not have a, a topic in mind or not have something that's already planned. Um, so, you know, there's a big difference in an ed camp happening on a Saturday where 300 educators show up who want to be there versus in a school district on a scheduled PD day when 250 teachers have to be there, right? Um, and so we, we took some steps to make sure that, again, they knew what an ed camp was, um, but we also prepared a lot of those sessions beforehand because we didn't want teachers to have that pressure of, okay, this is new. Um, you know, there's nothing on the board and, and staring at that blank board can be a little bit overwhelming for somebody who's new to the experience. So we wanted to kind of, you know, make sure there were some things filled in on the board. We left a couple of things open um, so that if people did have their own topics they wanted to discuss, they could. Uh, but it, it was a great experience. And the first time we did it, um, we had 35 sessions available for teachers uh, in a single day. And uh, it was an amazing experience. People got to go where they wanted to. Um, we had a second grade teacher who was teaching yoga to his colleagues um, and how to use yoga in the classroom with students. Um, you know, so there were a ton of different topics that people found personally relevant. Um, and, and not only as um, something that you have to learn for the classroom, but something to enrich your classroom. And I think, you know, just as you said, it's the same thing that we do with students. We find what their interests are and we build toward that and we, we build the learning around their own interests. Um, I think the ed camp works the same way. And it was, it was very powerful. So we did it, um, you know, several years while I was there. And each year was probably the most popular um, PD event that we did all year long. And I love the way that you really want teachers to take control of their own learning. And ed camp, allows you that opportunity because you have those choices. But how do you, you know, in your book, you really talk about inspiring people to take control of their own learning. How do you get people to do that? Yeah. And again, I, I think it, it builds from the ground up, right? So it's finding those people who are number one, interested in um, changing their own professional development uh, paradigm. Um, I'm actually uh, in the process of working on a follow-up to um, the four o'clock faculty book. So it is going to be uh, more about professional development. And uh, one of the chapters in there is, is how, to, um, how to navigate the naysayers, right? How do, you, how do you talk to those people who are not interested and it wouldn't matter what type of professional development you presented um, and how do you convince them to, to join in? And a lot of time it is... Um, bad experiences that people have had with PD. Mm -hmm. So I think it is modeling good PD for them. Um, you know, and uh, like as a building principal, I try not to make our, our staff meetings, you know, a list of agenda items. Um, there's sometimes when I have to do that as a principal, but you know, most of the time I'm trying to introduce, you know, professional learning uh, during that time that we have with staff. And um, it is one of those things where if you've had enough bad PD experiences over the years, um, you're going to turn away from any PD that is offered to you. So it is really about modeling and, and changing that professional development culture. And I, I've been dying to ask you this question. Have you had to change professional development during COVID at all? Yeah. So, you know, the pandemic hit and uh, life completely changed. And, uh, you know, professional development is certainly included in that. Um, in my school, uh, just last year, we had started a uh, a program called PD Lift, uh, which uh, Lift is an acronym standing for learning and innovation from teachers. Um, so the idea being that our own experts in the building were going to share with their colleagues. Uh, but then we also connected with two other schools who are um, in the immediate uh, vicinity of us. And 
Um, the goal was to meet once a month. And so we used to get together in person once a month at one of the schools. Um, you know, teachers who don't necessarily see each other on a regular basis can come together and share ideas. Um, it was amazing in the first year that we did it. You know, teachers were coming together and um, getting a chance to collaborate. And then all of a sudden last March, you know, we, it got shut down. So um, we've gone online with it. Um, it has, you know, we've still continued to do it. Um, we've tried to tie it into um, maybe some mental health breaks for teachers as well. Um, you know, just giving everybody kind of a break, um, you know, give them a chance to talk and collaborate and, hey, what's been working for you versus, you know, something that's been working in one of the other schools. Uh, it's been a good chance for them to collaborate. Um, you know, a lot of the coffee EDU, uh, you know, sessions that I attend on a Sunday in person, um, those have now kind of, you know, fallen by the wayside, but we've taken them online. Um, you know, a lot of my PD is, is going through Voxer, uh, where I'm able to kind of connect mm -hmm. with other educators, um, you know, around the country and, and find out what they're doing that's working for them. So um, I think it's one of those things where we've taken everything online. Um, you know, for some teachers, it's picking up a book, a good PD book and, and uh, finding something to read that's helping them within the classroom. So do you have your own Voxer channel that you use? Yeah, so um, I am on Voxer, um, and then uh, there's a group uh, called 4OCF PLN, um, and... 4OCF, 4 O'Clock Faculty. Yep, 4 O'Clock Faculty, PLN, 4OCF PLN, um, and they started um, just, it started just as a book study of the book um, in, right. let me think about this, uh, 2018. Um, it was a four-week book study, and at the end of the book study, um, everybody in there said, this is amazing. We need to keep this going. And here we are almost uh, two or three years later now and um, thousands of messages like that I can't even keep up with because the oh. people in there are so prolific. And um, it's, it's really turned into um, uh, what we like to call a PLF, right? The professional learning family because mm -hmm. people have connected. They found those people who um, really give them the best ideas and the best learning. And uh, it, it's been awesome. So it's a, a powerful group. Um, I don't get to contribute as much as I would like to now, um, but they're just an awesome group of educators who really enjoy, um, you know, testing the boundaries, um, thinking about, you know, what might work or not work for students, uh, but really student centered and student focused. So you really are revolutionizing. <laughs> we're, we're trying. Yes, you are. And I'm sure, you know, it was challenging for everyone, obviously, uh, where we all had to pivot with COVID. But I think it probably was a little bit easier for you because you were able to take pages out of your book, literally, to uh, implement some of those rogue type of uh, scenarios that you were able to suggest. So that I'm sure was helpful as well. And I am quite sure that once this pandemic is over, everyone's going to be super excited to get back to those ed camps and coffee EDUs to be in person. And we all look forward to those, I'm sure. Um, now, you, we talked about uh, the concept of Rogue, uh, but also in your book, you talk about Fight Club. Can you explain that a little bit too? Sure. Um, so when I was writing the book, uh, I, was, I was waking up at 4.30 in the morning, uh, every morning. Uh, so my, my goal was to write before the kids got up and I had to start taking care of the, the daily routines of the day. Um, and so on some mornings, you know, it would be an inspired writing session. I'd be pumping out word after word and, you know, an hour and 10 minutes, I'd still be sitting there like knowing that I needed to go jump in the shower and get on with the day. Um, but, you know, words were coming out. Some days it was, you know, 15 words, you know, 20 words, two sentences, struggling to write. Um, the Fight Club was one of those inspired mornings where I couldn't stop writing. Um, and I had been having a conversation with uh, another colleague about um, educators and how much they love to um, argue about things, right? So anytime you bring up an education topic, you will get, you know, educators on both sides kind of arguing uh, the topic. So um, I, I connected it right away to that idea of fight club, right? And um, can we take, you know, what would normally turn into an argument in the, in the faculty room um, and turn that into a positive, right? So how can we have people on both sides arguing the issue um, and, and not necessarily to, um, to the point of hurt feelings or getting anybody upset, um, but more so to the idea of 
um, let's understand this topic from all sides, right? Let's think about, um, you know, what might be both sides of the argument and, and how do we come to an agreement as to how to, to fix, you know, a problem or how to address something um, by, by thinking about the arguments of both sides. So that fight club, um, you know, was, was immediately something that um, I wrote about and uh, connected to, to professional development, right? Like we have teachers who love to argue. Let's, let's take advantage of that. Let's bring them together to argue on purpose, uh, but ultimately to make all of us better. Yeah. You know, it's funny because whenever I do PD, I always try to model in my sessions, what should be done in the classroom. So um, if I, you know, I'm trying to show, talk about cooperative learning, I'm not just going to talk about, I'm going to have the teachers actually do that. And what you're talking about here is, are the skills that students need to have in the classroom as well, but teachers, adults, we need to practice those as well. And so instead of these fighting two sides, um, in fact, with cooperative learning, we talk about the term consensus. Right. So if everyone can say, you know, it may not be my first choice or second choice, but if everyone can say I can live with that, then consensus has been met. And it's a great way to meet in the middle um, as part of, of that fighting. Right. So but it is important for teachers to be doing that so that they can also um, show that proper use of debate in the classroom as well. So um, I think I think it's great. And we really look forward to all of your uh, next brilliant ideas coming out in your next book. When do you have an ETA on that? Um, I guess depends on your bedtime if you can get up early. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. it's funny. I'm actually just finishing up uh, my final revisions before I send off my uh, my uh, manuscript. So um, probably I'm hoping this summer or uh, uh, fall for this year. Wonderful. Yeah, Wonderful. yeah it's a good, good time for release, right? Absolutely. I hope so. Yeah. So Rich, I have one more question for you. Sure. So I see you everywhere. You're all over social media. You're working at four in the morning on a book. You're working with teachers and people everywhere. What has become clear to you through all of your engagement? Um, there's, there's a lot more work to do. Um, and I think that is the, the piece. Um, and especially now um, going through what we've been going through over the past year um, for educators, um, you know, who've been putting their all into everything that they do. Um, you know, we still have kids who are, um, you know, falling through the cracks. And I think that's the biggest piece is, you know, we're, we're always going to work um, above and beyond to make sure that we're doing our best for students. Uh, but I think there's a lot of work that we can do from a, from a system standpoint, um, you know, and, and starting with professional development, um, implementing things that will help teachers um, instead of, you know, taking up their time with mandated content or, mm -hmm. you know, things that they don't necessarily need. So I think it's, um, you know, a lot of work to be done and, and hopefully everybody gets on that page of taking, um, taking control of their own professional development and really advocating for themselves to get good PD. Right. It's really the only way to get that true buy-in so that they have that ownership for it and it becomes theirs. So um, I think that's the biggest takeaway and the more that we can, and I think now it's a lesson learned from, it's one of those silver linings from the pandemic because now we realize there are so many different formats and platforms where we can learn. So hopefully those will be absorbed uh, through professional development even when we are back in, in person completely. So, yeah. So Rich, we want to thank you, first of all, for redefining, redefining professional development because it needed to happen. But I know that people will want to get your book, uh, reach out to you. How do they get your book and find you? Yeah, so um, you can find me at 4oclockfaculty.com. Uh, so it's F-O-U-R, oclockfaculty.com. Um, every, everything there is uh, contact information, uh, book links if you want to purchase the book. Um, I, I do a, a daily blog four times a week. Um, so oh, I'm wow. always writing and sharing um, on four o'clock faculty. So you can find everything there. Oh, that's terrific. So thank you for joining us today. We, we enjoyed hearing about all of the innovations that you've done and the way that you've inspired so many people. And for our listeners, we ask you to do us a favor and hit that subscribe button so that you don't miss any of our episodes. So thank you for joining us and staying linked up. Thanks, Rich. Thanks, Jerry. Thanks, Jamie. Take care. Thank you for listening. And if you would like to stay linked up, 
Be sure to follow us on Apple and Spotify and subscribe to us on YouTube.